to the FeeCast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. I am Richard Lawrence. Today with an abbreviated and abridged panel, we have Anna Jane Peril and Marianne March. Hello. Dan Sanchez has decided that he actually wants to get some work done today. So he has a beard to grow. He's very busy. It's, it takes a lot know? of concentration to get yeah, that going. Yeah, absolutely. I get it. I want him to focus on that. Eat a lot of protein, we'll biotin. Con- we'll continue with Beard Watch yes. 2018 yes. next week when he's okay. back on the show. So this week, we're going to talk about something that's been in the news, and it's the possible end of an era for a company that many, many people throughout our American history in the past century or so have uh, patronized, and that's Sears, which was formed as Sears Roebuck and Company 132 years ago. They have declared their bankruptcy. Well, what does that mean? Because I feel like since I was maybe 10 or 15, I've been hearing kind of, oh, they're scaling back their, right. you know, they're scaling back their, <laughs> I guess, business processes. So this means they are officially as an entire company saying that we, like, we're done. Yeah. Not quite. Right. So they haven't had a profitable year since 2010. And they announced in August that they were closing around 46 stores. But things haven't been good. It's hard times. They merged with Kmart um, several years ago, and now they're planning to close another 142 unprofitable stores. But we should definitely note that there are still going to be hundreds of stores all over the place. Okay, and Um, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, like, so if they're still, see, when I hear bankers, it's like they're shutting all the stores down. That's what I thought it meant for Kmart, too, and that happened to Kmart. And so I thought it meant, like, Sears is going to be gone. So they filed a debtor in possession loan, which means that they just need enough liquidity to keep the business going. So they, but they also had a big debt, $134 million debt payment coming up, and they were reportedly saying that they weren't going to be able to cover it. They didn't do it on Monday, which is why Mm -hmm. they filed what's called Chapter 11 bankruptcy, which basically allows them the debtor in possession uh, kind of situation. They can reorganize their debt so they can continue to operate. And they can continue to have, you know, money coming in, continue mm-hmm. to have that liquidity, like Marianne said, to continue operating businesses. I think they had something on the order of 1,200 stores even as early as this spring, and they've scaled down dramatically. And mm-hmm. they plan on operating uh, a reduced number of stores yes. through the end of this year, through the Christmas and holiday season. And then I suppose we'll see where things are at the beginning of 2019. Assuming that those are profitable stores still. I mean, that's what I don't understand mm-hmm. is at what point do you just cut your losses and say, this business model is not working anymore. Yeah. People aren't well, going to come here for their eyeglasses and their tires yeah. and their drills. Well, the the CEO, Eddie uh, Lampert, has been pouring his own money into the company for years, and he's been trying to financially save it for a long time. Uh, but they, they're still going to have 680 stores remain, and that's including Kmart locations. And we'll have to see if they, if they can manage to save it and come up with something new. If only they had thought to maybe follow the Amazon model and take their stores online. Yeah, like, is that is that what's taking over here? Is that really? It's just everything's much easier to get online. I know it's true for me. It's interesting because I was trying to recall the last time I've been in a Sears location. And Man. honestly and truly, I can't remember. But on a regular basis here in Atlanta, we have a place called Pont City Market that used to be the big mm. distribution center for Sears in Atlanta. And it's right along yeah, the Beltline. Yeah, it's a huge line. warehouse. Yeah, it's this beautiful mm-hmm. brick building. Mm-hmm. And over the past five years or so, it's been converted into a whole mixed-use retail, uh, you know, food mm-hmm. and residential and office space. And it's gorgeous. And you go in there and you see some of the callbacks to yeah. when Sears used to be, you know, running a big warehouse out of that area. It's right on the Beltline, which mm-hmm. is the old sort of circular railroad that was here in Atlanta. So you'd get shipments and then they would go in that yeah, sort of circular railroad, drop them off there, and people would pick up what they ordered at the distribution center or have it delivered. It's impossibly huge, the Pont City Market. And it is, Pont City Market is celebrated as one of those ways that we see um, us moving away from, you know, early uh, 20th century to now is that we're making mixed use buildings yeah. that are really mm-hmm. cool and I think represent. Um, you know, diverse interests, diverse needs, and also like the increasing, I mean, to me, I don't know, it represents like luxury in America is like these upscale restaurants and um, stores are becoming more to me publicly accessible. It's right in the heart of Atlanta. Um, And we're moving from just like a giant warehouse of goods at Sears. The brick and mortar model Mm -hmm. is outdated. And that's what's making Sears suffer right now because you mentioned Amazon. And and Amazon has just sort of taken everything by storm, right? Mm -hmm. You can order anything Mm -hmm. from there. But Mm -hmm. there was a time when that was Sears. And that was pretty much the place you could go to for everything. Like you said, drill bits, Mm -hmm. tires, clothes. It's Sears. My parents uh, tell these amazing stories. My dad's very, he loves, you know, the bootstrapper story. He talks a lot Mm -hmm. about being... 
um, very kind of, I mean, him and my mom were on their own when they were first married right. um, and they got a Sears credit card <laughs> and they used it for everything, including dental care, which I what? think is absolutely. In the Sears? Yeah. Yeah. So it was just, it was set up in this little, like there was nothing but a partition between you and like the shop, you know, the clothing that's on the racks. It's like. So you're like in this little sort of cubby between yeah, the sweaters and supposedly, the jeans. Supposedly, but also, Getting dental you know, work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Apparently this is where he got his fillings. They got their fillings there for years and put it on their credit card and would pay it off. And it kind of Sears represented an opportunity for people who are trying to make their lives better, yeah. trying to do good mm-hmm. things for themselves, like dental care, um, that don't necessarily have, you know, the money on them, that don't have the liquidity, but essentially wanted to improve their lives. And I thought that that was such mm-hmm. a cool, to me, a very meaningful, like my dad loves that story. He's like, you, you know, you just have to, um, Sears represented kind of giving someone an opportunity who may not have otherwise had an opportunity. Oh, totally. And yeah. we'll get into that a little bit more yeah. in a bit, but I sort of wonder from your perspective, each of you, is this bankruptcy, which is not the end of Sears. It is a serious reorganization. So they're going to have to really look at what their business model is in the Amazon era. But is this bankruptcy, this, this next chapter of Sears, a good thing or a bad thing in today's sort of society? Good for who? I'll leave that up to you. I mean, is this good for, let's say, the consumer? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over you, Anna Jane, and answer and answer it uh, myself, and say that I think that there is probably a net positive for the consumer. Okay. I think that it's sad, and we have a lot of nostalgia for four Sears, similar to how we feel about I think Toys R Us, right. which um, has gone through a similar hard time. And they've closed totally, mm-hmm. so S- Toys R Us ain't coming back. Yeah. But I think that if people were getting enough value out of Sears, that people would still be going there. I myself haven't been inside of a Sears in a long time to purchase anything. Right. Sometimes I'll mm-hmm. cross through one on my way to a different store in the mall. But department stores in general just aren't my bag, baby. And well, well, that's why I was saying maybe it's not. To me, it's not a positive for the consumer because it's like, why are we still? Why? Why are we even? Why do we still have stores for Sears at all? It's like, why, why are people using them? Is that even beneficial to us as a society? Is anyone out there using these stores anymore? I don't yeah. know. Well, I think that's a question that could be extended beyond just Sears yeah, to very true. stores selling anything that you, maybe you don't need on demand. Yeah. So I think of maybe like Home Depot. That might be a store that you would actually want to go in and, and buy it right then and there and not mm-hmm. have it shipped. But I could be wrong. And I think with Sears, with the clothes and... I don't. Where do people buy their washers and dryers now, though? I guess that's my. I can my buy it on buy? Amazon. Well, Best yeah, you buy can buy Amazon. it online. Best Buy. Yeah. I, that's where I think of when I think of washers and right. dryers. I don't know. Yeah. But so even, it's an interesting question, right? Because obviously Sears existed until today and still does, yes. right? So there's some role for a department store, and in many places in the country, the Sears Auto Center is one of the only reputable garages, right? So yeah. the only real place you can go to buy tires or get your car mm-hmm. serviced, and many of those locations are, are closing too. And so I think it's important for us to just take a step back occasionally from our sort of urban Atlanta mm-hmm. kind of framework that we operate yeah. through and say, you know, Sears has existed and has provided a lot of value in the past few decades even, even since Amazon and internet retailing uh, hit, hit sort of the consumer world, mm-hmm. right? So I think it does provide some value, but I think we'll get into later why this might in the long run, maybe even the medium run, uh, be a net benefit for consumers even more. So mm-hmm. I want to go real quickly because I think this is, this is an interesting topic to talk about. Some of the history of Sears. Sears mm-hmm. made a huge impact on America and the wealth and the ease with which we enjoy that wealth in this country. And one of the biggest ways was the Sears catalog. Yeah, that was um like you said like you said earlier it's I to me Sears is the Amazon of yesteryear. It is very it represents just access to an immense array of goods for the average consumer. It was something mm-hmm. like one in every four households had a Sears catalog yeah. in it um in the early 1900s. Um, I think that is, you know, at Fee, we love innovators, we love entrepreneurs. Sears was an incredible entrepreneurial effort. Um, one thing I heard that was more anecdotal that I think is really charming um, is that Mr. Sears, uh, he <laughs> believed that his catalog should be just less, like a half inch smaller um, on both, you know, on both on all sides than the, um, it was the other 
It was the other department store that was really popular then, uh, Montgomery Ward. Ward. Yes, that's what it was. So it was just a slightly smaller catalog, uh, like height and width wise, so that when people are cleaning their houses and they stack their catalogs, it goes on top. <laughs> on top. Yeah, oh, that's that clever. Yes, I love yes. that story. That's but. Steve Jobsian <laughs> yeah, in right? its attention yeah. to detail and mm-hmm, sort of thinking mm-hmm. through all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah. one of the things I think is most interesting about the catalog, because I think back to our conversation earlier about the Pont City Market, right? So that wasn't an actual store people went to. They Mm -hmm. mostly placed orders through the mail, and then the items would arrive at the distribution center by freight train and then go out and be delivered by whomever, the U.S. Postal Service or whatever private delivery service Sears had employed at that point. One of the most interesting stories about Sears, I believe, is the impact that catalog shopping had on racism during the Jim Crow era. Yeah, yeah. Because Mm -hmm. when you think back to that time, the sort of turn of the 20th Mm -hmm, century, mm -hmm. you can think back to the way in which, in the South at least, uh, where we are in the Jim Crow South, uh, you know, people would have to go to the general store or another store, Mm -hmm. most likely owned by a white person. Sometimes that person might not be as willing to sell to a black person. And uh, maybe even just introduce delays into the sales process. Mm -hmm. And so you're a black person, you're coming in, uh, you want to buy something, maybe you have to wait a while. Uh, These are big, big concerns. So not only not selling to black people at all, but also making it much more difficult for them. The Sears catalog actually made it much easier for people Mm -hmm. to both order anonymously without you know, showing up and making someone make the decision to discriminate or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also gave them some, something much more powerful than the ability to buy from retail. It gave them dignity. Mm-hmm. They could access all of the things that otherwise uh, privileged non-black people, i.e. white people in the South, could access. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This was an amazing innovation yeah. that made it possible for black people to rise up economically and in, in their own living standards. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, subvert ra- racial hierarchies that were still in place at the time. That really is amazing. I can only imagine. It's just equal access to goods for all, right? Yeah. And, that, and that's what's so cool about it. And especially, I mean, it's not that, you know, this company's not saying, well, I care about equality. They're saying, I, I, I want to make a profit. I care about getting goods mm-hmm. to as many people as possible. And in that way, like you said, we give dignity to all, we give access to all. And I think that that's a really cool idea. Yeah. Um, they were making something something like, so Sears by 1907, I think, they were making what is the equivalent of today's $1.3 billion worth um, of profit. Um, wow. And uh, and that's just insane to me if you compare it to like what we're doing with Amazon now or like what we see with Amazon and everything now. Mm-hmm. Um, so Sears was just, just this, to me, like, uh, monster of a, I think, of a provider of goods and of goods, um, and like you said, I think that it just it provided access to goods in a way that people used to not have. They used to have to go into town, go to a store, and mm-hmm. hopefully they had one of the two different sewing machines that were available yeah. at the store. So in some ways, Sears was a disruptor to those small country stores in the same way that Amazon is a disruptor to Sears. That's right. That's right. You know, it's also interesting because just going back to the disruption factor many of these black people who typically had to go into general stores, they were sharecroppers, and the people who owned the general stores were, in many cases, the people who owned the land that they were working on. Mm. So it kind of added another Mm -hmm. sort of dimension of hierarchy that they had to go against. Another one of the things I think was uh, sometimes under... Uh, misrepresented, uh, let's just say misrepresented, about the way in which Sears had an impact on the American economy was there were so many things that they offered. Yeah, houses. Houses. That's yeah. the coolest thing. I love. I love. Um, I love looking at pictures of Sears houses. Um, they sold just like IKEA sells. You know, you can build your own bed frame. They sold houses you could build from scratch with your bare hands. Um, and they, you had a little guide about how to build it. Um, and you go pick up all of your wood and all of your pieces, and you just build a house from scratch. And it's like it a is the coolest DIY thing. house from yeah, Sears. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was shockingly affordable too at the time. It was something like two thousand bucks, which uh, in 19 in the early 1900s would have been like fifty thousand dollars fifty five thousand dollars um so you have a piece of land today. you put up a house yeah. yeah yeah and that's the coolest thing so it, it also um something that people note that it was really sears was critical in undermining um institutional and and governmental racism in redlining right through right. zoning so where yeah. they said basically that certain types of people can't go into these areas or buy homes mm-hmm. well yeah so redlining, is that what you mean by redlining well redlining is is basically it's the name given to um systematic 
disadvantage, um, and and specifically people refer to when the National Housing Act was, um, the National House Housing Act of 1934 um, created the Federal Housing Association, right. and they basically said, they're, they were in, they were created to put a stop to you know a run on mortgaging and like being able to provide mortgages to anyone at any time um, it, in theory to um, stabilize the economy but what it really created was a situation where the government then created a, a an entity that could say which neighborhoods mortgage companies banks were allowed to insure or uh -huh. were allowed to provide mortgages for and which insurance companies were allowed to provide insurance for so they would say you've got type A neighborhoods which are the best neighborhoods mm -hmm. i.e. the most rich and typically the most white right. um, and then you've got all the way down to you know type D which is the red line neighborhoods mm -hmm. um, because this was also a color coordination system which is why they call it redlining um um, it, those were oftentimes the most the most impoverished neighborhoods, but but also African American predominantly African American communities. Um, and so what it created was a system where banks and insurance companies were de incentivized to provide mortgages mm -hmm. to um, to black people um, because the the FHA wouldn't insure them. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it is systematic national racism. So how did Sears impact that? So Sears basically said, not only can you buy a house from us, you can also buy, you don't have to pay up front for that entire house. You don't have to pay us all $2,000. You can get on a mortgage system with us. Sears sort was providing private plan. mortgages. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Um, and almost anyone could get one. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, it was... Um, I've seen ads again. Like I'm fascinated by by the by the houses that Sears offered at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you could buy houses for payments as low as twenty five dollars a month, and it's like, <laughs> wow, that's so cool. Um, yeah, so they were offering private insurance as well on your house. So it's like you get insurance and mortgages through Sears, and so it mm -hmm. disrupts redlining. So obviously, those policies were horrible that were limiting people in their ability to buy a house. But I think that. In the time between being able to eliminate policies like that, because sometimes when these things get enacted, it's really hard to weed them out, that in that time we can say that those policies were bad and that we don't approve of them. But before they could be eliminated, there were options for people of color to get housing. Mm -hmm, that's really mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah. And it was, I mean, it's private. It was privately provided. And I think that that's so cool. And it's basically, to me also, like redlining or thinking about neighborhoods as undesirable neighborhoods or desirable neighborhoods yeah. is so static. And it's it, it completely... Uh, washes us of any opportunity to change that and to say, I want to improve my neighborhood. Um, and I think that Sears came in and said, or I mean, Sears existing um, mm -hmm. empowered people to say, I want, I want to stay in my neighborhood. I don't want to have to move to be, right. to be insured. Right. I'm going to build a house here and it's going to be mm -hmm. beautiful and I'm going to stay here and I'm going to make this community better. Um, I just, I just love Sears in that way so much. It's such a cool thing. And when you're again yeah. in Ponce city market, that old distribution center for Sears Roebuck, mm -hmm. you can see some of the ads for these things and they're yeah, really cool to pull them up online. You can see some of the images of these. Mm -hmm. Some of these houses are actually selling for a million dollars wow. these days. So they've retained their value. They, oh yeah. Well, and it's like, there's like clubs now where people get to, Together and like hunt for Sears houses. They just <laughs> go around the neighborhood and like see if they can find yeah. compared to the designs that they had. And um, it's very, very cool. So they started selling them in the catalog in 1908. Mm -hmm. There were mm -hmm. over 400 variants. And mm -hmm. some estimates put the number of units sold at between 70 and 75,000. So it's not a gigantic number. One of the thing, but but still significant, of course. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think is most interesting about this, among the 400 plus models, Many of them included accommodation for things such as central air conditioning Ooh. and electricity and plumbing. Now we're talking. This is, you know, all the niceties mm -hmm. and luxuries at that time of life were being brought to the masses through mm -hmm. Sears. And so, yeah. and these were, you know, easy to assemble. You didn't have to mill anything. You didn't have to be, you know, Abe Lincoln in the woods, cutting <laughs> down the trees, putting the cabin and together. And you didn't have to hire anyone to do it either. It's like you were doing it yourself. You could. Yeah. I mean, yeah. some assembly required, but you yeah. could hire someone to help you out with that, do <laughs> mm. a whole house raising if you, you know, lived in that type of area. Yeah. So another thing, uh, another item that Sears sold, aside from the houses, that's just so interesting to me, is um, steel string guitars. And this is actually referenced in it's very an, specific. It is, and and this is of course with me. I'm a musician, amateur wise. Uh, I, I didn't always know wanted that. a double bass player. Oh yeah, uh, I was gonna say. Well, never mind. You, I knew that. I thought you meant like guitar player. No, as well. no, 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 no. <laughs> Um, but string instrument nonetheless, and in fact, the double bass is a member of the guitar family, so oh, really, uh, so, sort of related. But mm -hmm. anyway, there's an article at Reason Magazine, our friends at Reason Magazine, in 2012 by Chris Kjornis, and he wrote that because Sears offered steel string guitars for 
one dollar eighty nine cents, mm-hmm. which was essentially about fifty dollars in mm-hmm. today's uh, money. Um, Sears really inspired the creation of the entire musical format of the Delta Blues, which was another African American um, sort of art form um, mm-hmm. that emerged mostly because of the easy availability of the steel string guitar. Mm-hmm. I just think that's such a cool thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that is a really, a really interesting. I, I didn't know that story. I didn't know that that. Uh, that was so they made the Delta Blues possible. Yeah. Yeah. One other story that I really love is um, there was someone who actually bought out uh, Mr. Roebuck's shares in Sears Roebuck. His name was Julius Rosenwald, and he became a part owner in 1895. Mm-hmm. And he ended up becoming a very well-known philanthropist for the African American community. Mm-hmm. And he ended up donating 4.3 million dollars through his entire <laughs> philanthropic efforts. Um, which would be more than $75 million today, to start these Rosenwald schools for African Americans in mostly rural areas in the South. Mm -hmm. And these were new schools with big open windows, uh, you know, a lot of light coming through. These were so unlike anything else that would have been available before the end of segregation Mm -hmm. for African American students. And in fact, so many people of note ended up going to these Rosenwald schools, including John Lewis, the famous uh, civil rights leader here Mm -hmm. from Atlanta, and uh, Maya the Angelou. poet Maya Angelou. Yeah, exactly. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. And these really ended up phasing away pretty quickly once segregation was uh Wait, overruled. was the intention specifically the, the customer base was African-American students? Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is really cool. I had and, no idea. And, you know, think about $75 million and how many schools that can open. And it mm-hmm. was a huge mm-hmm. philanthropic uh, initiative mm-hmm. by someone who made a lot of money off of this Sears enterprise. Yeah. Thinking back to what we were talking about as Sears as a disruptor to those small country stores, there was a there was backlash against Sears from those stores. There was. They felt that Sears had an unfair advantage, that they were able to essentially buy in bulk and sell things at a lower price. And so there were campaigns of a sort for um, for merchants who were encouraging people to collect the catalogs and they would have bonfires and there were offerings. Is that not not exactly how people feel about Amazon today? (laughs) Is like, you know, small businesses are like complaining Mm -hmm. that Amazon has too much power. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Stop Bezos Act that we've talked about previously, it's it's that. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. And wasn't there something, Marianne, that Sears and Roebuck themselves had to end up posting pictures or publicizing pictures of themselves to prove that they were white? Oh, right. So that that was another part of it was that... A lot of racist merchants would say to try to discourage people from buying from Sears. They said that it was founded by um, by blacks and really, yeah. And so that's nuts. which they, it weren't. And yeah, but like that that that, that was even a conversation rather. is interesting to me that a business had to address something like that. Yeah. But that's yeah. wow. But there were there were implications implications for policy where there were antitrust and kinds of laws pushed mm. through. Try to try to stop these terrible oh, so you're saying companies that from enhancing even, our lives. So even policy, because typically when I think about antitrust mm-hmm. or I think about well, when I think about any sort of government involvement mm-hmm. in business goings on, I typically picture them siding with the larger companies. So you're saying yeah. that smaller businesses um, were encouraging policy that that basically undermines Sears, right? Okay, right. Okay. I mean that's. You know, we think of that as being pluralism when people get together with similar interests mm-hmm. to to stand up against their Goliath, whether it's a, a large or tiny Goliath, I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, they were using their power to wow. try to suppress them. Well, these Goliaths, as you have referenced, come and go, right? Mm-hmm, right. So we have an article on fee.org talking about the Fortune 500, the largest 500 publicly traded, or, or maybe not even only publicly traded companies in the United States, comparing the 1955 Fortune 500 to the 2016 Fortune 500, there are only 60 companies that appear on both. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you just sort of have to, you go through these cycles of, you know, companies that reach massive success and then eventually they Mm -hmm. become outmoded. And, Mm -hmm. you know, in economics, we sometimes refer to um, the notion of when some of these older type of businesses go away as creative destruction. Mm -hmm. Joseph Schumpeter actually came up with this notion that when resources aren't being used uh, efficiently or they're being underused, Mm -hmm. then a bankruptcy or a business collapse, uh, the destruction of a company, actually frees those resources Mm -hmm. to be used in a more creative, valuable way. And that's what's happened, we hope, with Toys R Us. That's why the investors in in the debt at Toys R Us have closed Mm -hmm. the shops because they have 
in theory, a better idea of what to do with it. And possibly, if Sears isn't able to compete in the internet era, they will be another example of creative destruction. And the idea is that that is better for consumers, right? Mm -hmm. Eventually, that does end up creating a better situation for them because obviously department stores weren't doing it for them. Because right? an inefficient use. So you're saying, so like when we talk about those freeing those resources, an inefficient use of the resources as it stands is ultimately more costly to the consumer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because you're mm -hmm. tying something up that could be used much more effectively otherwise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're pushing out the old outdated methods and new production methods are coming in and basically everybody's just chasing profits. And the good thing about that for us as consumers is that by them chasing profits, it makes things better. And then in the long run, it makes things cheaper and we all benefit from that. I always consumers. love referencing the quotation from the economist and Nobel laureate F.A. Hayek. He mm -hmm. said, profit is a signal that we're serving well people who we don't know. <laughs> yeah. So thinking yeah. about chasing profits, some people might say, yeah, that's not good. That's just sort of money grubbing mm -hmm. short term interest uh, for, uh, you know, business owners or shareholders. But, you know, actually by generating profits, we're showing and demonstrating value that's being mm -hmm. created for people on the consumer level. And so, yeah, in the end, when you end up seeing these old brands and old stores closing, you begin to wonder, well, maybe that heralds something new that can yeah. be done, not only with those resources, but with the resources that you're putting into your retirement, into the, into the stock market, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. hopefully when you're you know investing, you're, you're investing in places that are possible to get higher return. And, and we don't want that being yeah. locked up in Sears. Right. I hope this doesn't sound heartless, but I just think of we have to clear out the, the old brush sometimes of our economic firms to make way for the new ones. Mm -hmm. What are the next advances going to be? They're not going to have room to grow if there's a lot of Deadwood. Yeah. Well, not to derail the positivity here, but my, <laughs> my question is, and this is, I think, an argument you hear sometimes, is that, okay, well, yeah, but like a bunch of Toys R Uses are closing. Um, what are all those people that work at Toys R Us mm -hmm. going to do now? Well, hopefully they can work at the at the next you know giant to come mm -hmm, along, mm -hmm. or or not. They could use their skills to to do something else. I wish them well and hope that those people will be able to rebound quickly and find new new fulfilling work. Um, it's just it doesn't make sense to burn through a lot of resources mm -hmm. to to keep these things alive. I oh, I'm doing some reading and I found that um, billionaire Isaac Larian, who is the founder of the toy company that makes um, Bratz dolls started a GoFundMe <laughs> campaign to save Toys R Us. And they raised a lot of money, save but it, it didn't I mean, yeah. work. It didn't it didn't save Toys R Us. If so. you need a chair, if you need charity to save you, then you're not a. Like, you see what I mean? Like then yeah. it's not a. It, then it's a business that doesn't make sense anymore. No, you're absolutely right. If people aren't willing to give you money because you give them something good, mm -hmm. then uh, then why why exist? And it could sometimes come across as heartless to say those people are going to find new jobs. And of course, that doesn't come without pain and, and right. cost is, and that? training. But but the major point that I'm trying to convey here yeah. is a business is not an employer first, yeah. right? A business is only an employer mm -hmm. in as much as its employees are creating value for the consumers. Yeah. It mm -hmm. all comes back to the consumer. You should not and cannot subsidize something for very long mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. it's not actually producing right. value for the end customer. And that's yeah. really the only reason that a business exists. Well, and it's, uh, I, so I uh, teach Boy Scouts. I teach them entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. They get their entrepreneurship badge um, through some of my work. And one of, the, one of the things that we repeat over and over again to them about entrepreneurship and innovation is that um, you can serve yourself. You can be selfish. You can care about profit, but you only serve yourself well when you serve others that's well. Right. And that's mm -hmm. it. And that's the lesson that we take from um, from creative destruction is that we serve we serve ourselves well when we serve others well. Yeah, yeah. We also do ourselves in the economy a vast disservice when we ignore price signals. Mm -hmm. We saw this mm -hmm. in communist Russia when they. <laughs> were lifting prices actually out of the Sears catalog That's right. because they didn't they know didn't have what any, the, pri any price mechanism right, of any kind. Yeah. Exactly. To, to clue them into what the demand was or even the supply for these yeah. things. So they would just name an arbitrary <laughs> price and they would have to stick to that for a year because their prices were rigid. So regardless of how much it cost to make, regardless of how many people wanted it. Right. Yeah. Regardless of what changes happened yeah. in the economy. Mm -hmm. If people were desiring pens instead of pencils, it didn't matter that pens were, you know, less than pencils. They were still uh, that price for the entire year. And that just mm -hmm. goes back to the sort of comprehensive nature of the Sears catalog, that it was a single source that you could go to in a country to look mm -hmm. up the prices, however flawed that approach was, 
Uh, but isn't it kind of funny that they looked it up in a market-driven uh, context, in the Sears mm-hmm. context, to see what they should be selling nails for over in uh, a country that didn't have a price system? Yeah. yeah. I wonder if if there are any of these giant companies that could stand the test of the time. Is that even possible? Because we do see even a company like Sears that has been in our historical memory, at least, mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. over 100 years. Is it possible that one could last longer, could last 500 years? Uh, I mean, yeah, that's a really hard question just because even we as a country are very young. So it's really yeah. hard to picture what a, what a company that lasts um, – looks like I think that I mean you know I hate we talk about Amazon all the time but Amazon sold books and now they sold they just sold me socks right before we started taping like, now you I'm, can buy yeah. containers that you can live in mm-hmm. on Amazon oh, really? so they're selling houses huh. too see that's what I, I picture Amazon moving into like how can we fully inform someone's life yeah um, but I guess I just wonder a hundred years from now when you know name a name a company that doesn't exist yet um mm. and would they be in the same boat of kicking themselves for saying dang it why why didn't we as sears just put our catalog online right. why didn't mm-hmm. we just and mm-hmm. they did it was just too little too late yeah. they didn't mm-hmm. have the infrastructure to be able to do that yeah. marianne when you ask that question i think of brands more than companies right mm-hmm. because you think of um, well maybe one big company and brand is coca-cola Mm-hmm. They've been around for quite a while now, and you know they are thriving, and they're one of the most recognized brands. So they're probably an example of something with staying power, but they only do one thing. They make yeah. beverages, yeah. right? And they've really just changed the conversation around the beverage from, oh, it's occasional treat, to you need this with every sandwich yeah. or hamburger you eat. Right. <laughs> yeah. Share a Coke, Coke is life, Coke makes happy, whatever mm-hmm. the, the marketing blitz is today. But I also think of other things, you know, such as craft foods, who knows who owns oh. them today? Maybe Procter & Gamble owns Kraft. I'm not entirely sure. But you've got brands that exist for a while because people mm-hmm. are loyal to those because mm-hmm. they know those brands. But they have to be, in my estimation, they have to be very, very focused yeah. if they're going to survive. And the problem mm-hmm. with Sears is that they did everything, yeah. right? So possibly later Houses, down the road. dental work, tires. Yeah. All of it. Mm-hmm. So possibly later mm-hmm. down the road when you've got so many entrants coming in mm-hmm. to the internet commerce side of things, Amazon might need to go back to the base. I mean, jack of all trades versus master of none. Exactly. Kind of yeah. So I guess, and I think this is a question that applies to companies besides just Sears and to malls in general. Is what what do we think is going to happen to malls? Because Sears is a large anchor store in a lot of malls, and I know from working in retail that anchor stores basically control the malls. They decide what days they're open and closed. And if in the future we see a lot of anchor stores shutting down. I mean, are those malls going to turn those spots into gymnasiums? You know or? what they do, I think Marianne, are... is they turn them into sites to film movies yep. from the 1980s, yeah. including Stranger <laughs> Things, which is uh, something you can imagine when you visit the closing mall near where I live, uh, the North Cab Mall. It's like one of those yeah. places totally empty. It's got a movie theater. Mm-hmm. It's got maybe like a Belk or something like that, otherwise empty. So they're movie sets now for a bygone era. Well, this has been a really, really good discussion, but we're going to have to call it here (laughs) and uh, maybe talk about malls, maybe talk about some of this other stuff. I could talk about malls all day. (laughs) Uh, Be be mall rats ourselves. Maybe we'll do something from a mall at some (laughs) point. Um, (laughs) Awesome discussion. Very much enjoyed having the two of you here. We miss Dan, but yes. you know we'll see him again next week. And, we'll <laughs> and see, his beard. And well, we'll at see least his half beard of too. his face. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll see everyone back here next week on the FeeCast. Have a great weekend. <laughs>